Today is July 2nd, 2020, and my guest is economist and author Glenn Lowry of Brown University, where he is the Merton P. Stoltz Professor of the Social Sciences and Professor of Economics. Glenn, welcome to Econ Talk. Thank you, Russ. Good to be with you. I want to start with the issue you examine in your 2018 lecture at the Institute for Advanced Study in Toulouse, which we will link to, the persisting subordinate position of blacks in the United States. Uh, it's your wording. That was a lecture you gave two years ago in the aftermath of the death of George Floyd and other deaths of blacks at the hands of police. This issue is now deeply front and center in the United States. A lot of people are arguing that the situation, the inequality and the, the, what you call the subordinate position of, of blacks in America is, is due to what is being described as systemic racism. Um, does that phrase resonate for you at all? And if so, how? And if not, why not? Uh, I'm not a big fan of that phrase uh, because I think it conceals more than it actually um, uh, illuminates. Um, I think it's, it's a rhetorical, not a scientific claim. Uh, I think what people have in mind when they say systemic racism is that uh, many different kinds of processes, some of them are political, some of them are economic, some of them are social, some of them are cultural, have had the cumulative effect of uh, subordinating or marginalizing uh, the descendants of the slaves, and those processes are still ongoing. Yeah. But I don't think that takes me very, uh, very far. I mean, we would have to talk about examples. So there's a huge disparity in the performance across racial lines of young people uh, as measured by their um, grades and test scores and so forth like that in school, the SAT sure. test and so yeah. on. There's disparity in cognitive development. Now, we know from empirical investigations like uh, this classic paper by Derek Neal and William Johnson on racial wage differences, where they take the National uh, Longitudinal Survey of Youth, which has uh, information of the uh, uh, Armed Forces Qualification Test Score performance of the respondents in the survey when they were 14 to 18 years old, if I remember this correctly, when they were young, pre-adult scores. Yeah. And they then look, because it's a longitudinal data set, at the wages of the young adults after they've been in the labor market for 10, 15 years. And they look at the racial disparity, which is only a magnitude of 25% in the raw data, which after you end up controlling for these earlier life pre-market uh, cognitive abilities, they can get the uh, racial unexplained racial wage gap down to like 6 or 7%. So like three quarters of the difference in black-white wages in their data are accounted for by the cognitive uh, performance of the people in the sample when they were teenagers. Now, yeah, what do we do with that? Uh, exactly. That? I mean, uh, that's that's a uh, very significant thing. And so then I start asking myself, where does cognitive uh, uh, performance in uh, quantitative and verbal things come from? And uh, you know. One answer that you have to at least uh, entertain is that, well, there might be natural differences in these populations, and that's very political, and I'm not asserting that. I'm not asserting that. I'm saying that's a question, and it's a, actually it's an empirical and it's a scientific question for psychometricians and so on to consider. But there are many other things. There's the quality of education. There's the socialization processes. There are environmental influences. Is there lead in the water? How does that affect neurological development? There's, sure. you know, what's the family structure? What's the... You know, human development is a 24-hour-a-day, seven-day-a-week, 365-day-a-year phenomenon. It's not just the six hours a day, five days a week for 40 weeks out of the year that you spend in a classroom. And it so, starts before birth. And in indeed, it does start before birth. <laughs> and it depends on prenatal behavior of the parent. Yep. And it depends yep. on the, you know, uh, were they reading to the kid when the kid was two years old and uh, et cetera. Um, so I'm sorry, I've been want, uh, rambling so no. far. I forgot what the question was. Well, we were talking about the fact that um, the legacy, I, I would call it the legacy of slavery and the system. Uh, oh, of, you asked me about systemic racism. Yeah. Excuse me, Russ. Excuse That's me. That's all right. And what I was trying to say with the example was it's a very complicated process. I was using the example of SAT score gap. Right. 
gap of kids on the, uh, who gets into the Bronx High School of Science when they have an exam school in New York and, you know, whatever. And it's a very complicated, now you could say systemic racism, you could say. Um, it's a summary uh, of all those effects. And, and you put a label on it and you call it systemic racism, but there, there's no real information in that statement about what to do. That's a, it's a rhetorical move, I think, that's aimed at saying it's not the fault of the quote unquote victim, it's the fault yeah. of the quote unquote system. And there's a right. lot of stuff that's like this. So, so I, I tend to want to be a little cautious when I hear people invoking this kind of uh, broad, uh, broad category, and I want to, I want to then talk in a more concrete and explicit terms about, about what we're talking about. And there are many, many examples that I could give of this. There's the police. Uh, there's so-called voter suppression. Uh, there, there's uh, prison, uh, prison there's, system. Yeah, prison. Yeah, exactly. Education, which you alluded to, but I think you know your point that it's a rhetorical device. I think it is a rhetorical device, and I think, but it's more than that. I think in the in the eyes of the people who invoke it, I, I think the people who invoke it are essentially arguing that the system is rotten to the core, and that system is is multifaceted. It's political. It's economic. They blame capitalism. They blame uh, the political structure of that that is. They claim oppressive of, of minorities, people of color, and, and they want to start over. You know, my response to that is starting over doesn't have a great track record in Western or Eastern history. Uh, starting over is usually the road to tyranny. Um, it's what led – the French Revolution had that attitude. That didn't end well. Um, the yeah. communist the revolution, revolution didn't had the so same well. attitude. We got to start from scratch. The cultural and, revolution. Did yep, China, exactly, exactly. So, I think then the question, because for those of us who are skeptical of the value of starting over, even if we concede there are challenges in the current system for people of color and others, um, by but definition, may I, <laughs> may I offer something here? Because I yeah, think sure. there's a real. I, I think you're right that what people are saying is the system is rotten to the core. They're wrong about that. And I think that argument needs to be had. I'm quite, so prepared, to say Why? I'm quite prepared to say that. But I want to say one other thing, which is that the stance that the system is rotten to the core has the convenient consequence of um, uh, eliminating any necessity to make judgments and assessments of the extent to which people are responsible for their own fate. Yeah, okay? well said. It, it's a kind of leveling. It's a kind of de- uh, moralization or denormalization, uh, which says we're not going to make discriminating judgments amongst individuals because any disparities that we observe are necessarily the consequence of a morally illegitimate structure. Yep. Um, and that's a very, very dangerous slippery slope to be standing on. That's but, a Marxist. That's a Marxist claim, right? It, it's not very different from the standard Marxist critique of the economic system or you know outside of race. But yeah, I mean, it removes agency. Uh, it not only says you don't have any agency. It tells you don't even don't try because it's a waste of time. You have no shot. So as far as this is the big corrupt to the core, I mean, look, I'm a I'm an economist trained in the neoclassical tradition. Call me a neoliberal if you want. I mean, I, I really do think at the end of the day that the market's a pretty remarkable, uh, complex mechanism that you know incentives are real. That uh, profit is not the worst thing in the world. Excessive profit. You know, uh, uh, you know, uh, rent seeking profit, uh, monopoly profit, that's one thing. But the idea that people are trying to better their circumstances, that's the way of the world. I think the, the historical record is pretty clear. Centralization, the collectivization, um, the uh, massive, extensive uh, uh, political control over economic processes is the road to serfdom. I think Hayek was yeah. right about that. Now we agree on uh, that. I think we're richer by a vastly unimaginable amount uh, than were our great, great grandparents. And that the reason for that is capitalism, not socialism. Uh, I think that uh, there are uh, uh, people who are not starving uh, by the hundreds of millions uh, in South Asia and East Asia right now because of the globalized market uh, dynamic that has allowed them to enter into the modern economic sphere and uh, empowered through uh, recruiting into the industrial economy of the world, uh, hundreds of millions of peasants out of these villages in these rural places that people were living in, in punery. 
Um, I think that technology advances under the ingenuity of human beings who are largely motivated by self-seeking motives. Um, I think that the great universities and the uh, research laboratories of the great corporations that you see in Northern Europe and in uh, North America uh, are making mankind as a whole. They're not alone, of course. I mean, there are research labs everywhere, but I'm saying this is something that you can't deny the force of this over the last couple hundred years. So uh, start over again. I mean, it's madness. Uh, and I think, too, that uh, the United States, which is far from perfect, is not half bad uh, in terms of being a society that is um, um, uh, open and adaptive enough to accommodate with wave after wave after wave of immigration. And I know you're not supposed to compare uh, blacks to immigrants, but I'm talking about the society. I'm talking about the society. Sure. Uh, uh, incorporate them into this uh, burgeoning, uh, 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 dynamic, uh, prosperous uh, political economy that we enjoy here. I think that if you look at the status of African-Americans uh, over uh, you know, the last hundred years, I remember reading when I was in college, Gunnar Myrdal's book, uh, An American Dilemma, which was a close socioeconomic political assessment of the status of, quote, the Negro uh, in, I don't know, 1940. Man, I don't know, some like three quarters of employed African-American women were domestic servants. Uh, 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 agricultural labor was the modal occupation of men. Yeah. Uh, family incomes were like 30, 40 percent. They were shutting down the schools that these kids would go to in the South for three or four months a year so that they could go out and pick crops in the field, yeah. uh, et cetera. Uh, it's not as if we don't have some issues here, but the uh, status of African-American population on the whole in the United States of America over the last 75 years has experienced a revolutionary transformation uh, such that uh, the descendants of American slaves again, taken as a whole, are the richest and most powerful and influential population of African descent on the planet. So the idea that we want to scrap the system and start from scratch, um, as I say, I think it's, uh, it's, a, it's a very mischievous idea. Well, let's, that was incredibly eloquent. Uh, let, let's look at two areas that I think uh, you and I both agree could use some improving, uh, even if we don't start from scratch. Uh, the first is um, I, I want to talk about education, and I want to talk about police slash prison. Yeah. These are two areas that are uh, crucial in the in our conversation, national conversation we're having. Um, let's start with education. You, you alluded to earlier the challenges that that uh, that black students face, and their different racial differences that are, that are there. We don't fully understand the source of them. Um, and even the cognitive differences, of course, that you mentioned that appear in a test that was given in 14 to 18 years old, those tests can't, it's hard to measure cognitive differences with any, you can call it a cognitive difference, but it's not clear what you're measuring actually in reality. So, And I should acknowledge there's a whole vast literature out there that's critical along exactly the course. lines you so I know you, I know you meant that. Um, but I think <laughs> that the, the fundament, more fundamental issue for me, uh, and it's been a topic uh, of a lot of recent episodes here on the program is the uh, public school system versus alternatives for inner city uh, children. Most of them happen to be black, but not all of them, but poor children living in poor neighborhoods yes. whose parents are, are in poverty. Uh, I argue for the last three generations, roughly for 60 years, we have tried to improve that system through a variety of ways, the public school system, through spending more money. We spend a dramatically larger sum of money per student, corrected for inflation, we tried to play with class size, we tried a whole bunch of, we've increased certification. Uh, they've all failed in my view. Uh, it's also, of course, the case that the quality of the school, as you point out, is, is only a fraction, not a trivial fraction, but only a fraction of the environment that a, a young person uh, grows up in. But what are your thoughts on what we should be doing to improve education for uh, for children in poor poor neighborhoods and poor families in America? I think open things up to um, alternative sources of supply. I think charter schools, I think uh, vouchers, I think uh, choice, I think empowering parents. Um, 
I think competition for the uh, public uh, supply monopoly of uh, educational services to uh, people with modest incomes um, is the uh, way to go. I, I confess to you that I'm a neoliberal. I, I think market forces work even in the provision of public goods. Um, so uh, that's what I would want to see. I mean, uh, I think it's very interesting actually to contrast policing issues and education issues in terms of public employees providing services and inadequately or adequately to the populace. Now, Great. we know what a police yeah. union is. A police union is a, a blue line of silence that protects the bad officers and tries to give every prerogative to the rogue cop that's abusing people, and it's a bad thing. That's, that's the progressive view about a police union. Uh, and we know what a teacher's union. Teachers are union is a long suffering of these uh, people who are public servants who get paid not enough at all and who are the butt end of all the conservatives attack and the religious people who want to get to school choice. And um, that's, and you the could, progressive, that's the progressive view of the teacher's union. That's the progressive view of the teacher's union. But they seem for, inconsistent. For, they would appear <laughs> to be so. Um, and I mean, if you brought some of the. Um, empathy for the public servants who are teachers over to a sense of empathy for the extremely difficult job of being a police officer in an American city. And you brought some of the sense of judgment and the uh, insistence upon accountability that is reflexively invoked when we talk about police officers over to talking about how we want to think about our public servants who are providing educational services. I think we'd all be better off. Yeah, I said they were contradictory views. That's not, that's not what I said. They, they're, they're sort of, ha you just said it better than I did. And, and that's, uh, you know, we had uh, Jennifer Doliak on the program talking about the monitoring of police performance and the, the body cameras, the role body cameras have, and how on the ground in a, in a tense situation, an interaction with a, uh, uh, a person under great anger, stress, violence, whatever it happens to be that a police officer faces that can be captured on a body cam and then used as an educational lesson to figure out how to do that well is not very different from, I suggested in our conversation with Jennifer Doliak, not very different from filming teachers in the classroom and helping them get better at the problem students, classroom discipline management and so on. And that art, and it's an art. There's not a set of clean rules for those two types of very challenging interactions. One, of course, involves life and death, but the other is also life and death, the educational one, and in a different way, because those so many of those students are going to get left behind if their teachers can't educate uh, that classroom in, in an effective way. And so to me, the, a lot of that art has to take place school by school, police department by police department, with incentives skin in the game for the managers of those people. I think the current, the, the problem of unions that you, on the negative, you talk about the positive side, there is a positive side. The negative side is that it, it ends the, it, it can eliminate the buck stops here. I mean, why in this tragedy of, of George Floyd, um, you would think that the first people to be examined would be the chief of police and the mayor of the city. They're the ones in charge. but. We kind of realize, actually, they're not so much. Their, their ability to monitor and discipline, uh, fire, or promote, reward is limited by that union. And that's a big cost of that system, even though it does protect people who aren't rogue officers. Yeah, that seems right. Another thing that in the analogy between the public servants who provide educational services and those who provide the policing services that I see is that the outcome is of, of the uh, public good provision depends on the interaction between the service provider and the client. Uh, so yeah. teachers will say, look, you know, it's only six hours a day. I can't make the kid do the homework. I can't, you know, the, the home is chaotic or whatever. And, and I'm dealing with that. And that's why, you know, when you compare me to another classroom in terms of the average test scores of my kids, it's unfair. I don't have it control is. of that. <laughs> and the cop is saying, look, I just asked the guy to put his hand behind his back. If he had done that, yeah. 
I would have put the cuffs on him and, and we would have processed the arrest. But if, instead he fought me and I, you know, and he was going for my gun. And I mean, the situation became chaotic and I can't control that. It's not my fault that there's so many criminals out here with weapons and bad or attitudes and whatnot. So, you issues. know, but yeah. both of those points weren't to be taken on board by any critic who comes along saying you're not doing your job, public servant. And I think I just want to emphasize the point you made. I think it's um, people on the right who criticize teachers um, working in public schools can't imagine what it's like to teach a public classroom. They have no idea how hard it is. And people on the left, I think, struggle to realize how hard it is to walk the streets or even drive the streets of America in a, in a police cruiser. It's not an easy job. I have a lot of empathy for both groups. Uh, having said that, there's got to be accountability. There's got to be punishment for bad behavior. And I think the role of immunity in, in both of those systems is wrong <laughs> for police officers and what we could call rogue teachers, bad teachers. Not right. Yeah. So we're yeah. in agreement about that. Yeah. If Let's only the, the world would join us. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, it's coming along. I, I think there's some, we're making some progress, but there's a related piece of this. I think we'll bring us back full circle a little bit to the systemic question in the state of America, which is uh, the drug war uh, the legislative environment in which uh, drug use and drug sales are prosecuted in America has been incredibly uh, racially punishing of blacks. Uh, it's a, lar a large, not the whole part, but it's a large part of the so-called mass incarceration, the disproportionate share of both Americans in jail relative to other nations and black Americans relative to white Americans. Talk about that and what what we might do to make that better. Yeah, well, back in the, the day, it was 2007, I was invited to give the Tanner Lectures uh, on Human Values at Stanford, a couple of lectures, and I devoted it to this question of race and incarceration. A small book called Race, Incarceration, and American Values came out of that. Um, and, and you're right, uh, the drug war doesn't account uh, in entirely or even mostly for the disparity by race in um, arrest and imprisonment, but it's a big part of the story. Yeah. Um, the first thing I would say about that um, is it's not a surprise that you would see a lower class, a marginal minority population, male, young, overrepresented amongst those, if you decide that you're going to have this massive crackdown and mobilization against trafficking in these illicit substances, because the way people are going to sort themselves out in the informal labor market is that it's going to be the people with the least alternative opportunities who are going to be All the right. ones who are working this job, which is very risky. And, um, you know, the cops are, are the least of your problems and you got to worry about getting robbed and killed and your competitors. So on. it's not an easy job. And it doesn't, uh, if you believe, um, uh, Stephen Levitt and Sudhir Venkatesh, who did an analysis of the records that they somehow were able to get their hands on from a drug selling gang in Chicago. There's a paper published, I think it's in the Quarterly Journal of Economics, on the economics of drug selling gangs. Man, the, the, the wage rate for these guys is like 15 bucks an hour, yeah. you know, for something that has, a, I don't know, 0 0.01 chance of you getting killed in a year, <laughs> you yeah. know, kind of thing like that. So, um, uh, who else is going to be doing that except for the losers? So if I see that I have poorly educated and I have minority and urban, you know, on the other hand, the demand for the substance is very broadly distributed in the society. So you got to kind of balancing our cultural budget, which is we don't want the middle class to use drugs because it's bad, we decide, on the backs of, you know, it's a little bit like blaming the streetwalker for prostitution. You know what I mean? When there is, there is no market without guys with $100 bills driving yeah. down the street. I mean, likewise, there is no market for illicit substances without middle class uh, users of drugs, but it's going to be the so-called underclass uh, uh, suppliers of the services that end up getting zapped. So there's a just first order kind of injustice in that. The other thing I would say is, and I argued in these lectures, I think, you know, penalties are endogenous. We can pull back from the brink. We can start out on a drug war and then we can decide, oh, my God, this was a bad policy. Yeah, it's devastating communities. It's not really buying us anything. You know, uh, we, 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 we should change our minds. And 
to the extent, and here I might give systemic racism a little play, to the extent that a failure to reconsider because the main brunt of the f- cost is falling on people who we don't have yeah, that much cognizance to. of, we yeah. don't care about right. That's a kind of, I mean, I'm not going to argue with the liberals about this. That's a kind of systemic problem that, uh, that we need to be mindful of. That's very well said. It reminds me a little bit your analogy to um, funding education using a lottery, a state lottery that tends to attract very poor people. I mean, it, it's a bizarro yeah. social. It's a it's a form of regressive public policy that that um, doesn't make sense to me. It's a horrible idea. Um, certainly, the disparate treatment of uh, cocaine versus marijuana, which I think is driven by race tragically uh is definitely a part of this um but we i think and one other thing i'm going to add the public choice part to this because we we're talking about unions earlier and and entrenched interests um police departments like the drug war we should we should remember that it only gives them a lot of reasons to be powerful it allows them to uh take assets from people and and use them for their own benefit it's despicable in my view, and I, I hope uh, that this moment of, of awareness on these issues leads to some policy changes that you know, would have made sense for a long time. Yeah, and it should be mentioned, I mean, we live in the era of the opioid addiction epidemic, yeah. and there are lots of people dying, and it's an ongoing problem, and it's not as racially uh, uh, definable as had been the crack uh, cocaine epidemic. Uh, earlier, which tended to be more urban and black. Yep. Uh, but it's a big public health uh, issue. And, uh, you know, I, I suppose you should be careful about uh, cartels bringing substances across the border and whatnot. You should try to stamp, stamp them out. On the other hand, uh, addiction is a health issue and the people need, uh, they need, basically, they need access to support to try to deal with their health problem. So the therapeutic as opposed to the punitive uh, response to the problem. And again, Seems you like might argue idea. systemically, the instinct is going to be more toward therapeutic than uh, punitive if the subjects are more uh, sympathetic figures in the mind of the media okay. voter. For sure. And, and of course, uh, the heterogeneity of, of U.S. society is going to push us in various directions on, you know, uh, let me say it more, more, with a little more articulateness. In a more homogeneous society, you'd expect more compassion and more pushing toward a more therapeutic response than a punitive response. Um, and racism is only going to make that worse, uh, almost by definition. Um, uh, let's talk. The other thing I wanted to th- hear your thoughts on, I have a few more, but but one of the ones that's, in, in, that's front and center is, um, uh, this is, today's July 2nd, uh, front page of I think it's the paper today. Uh, they tore down the statue of Stonewall Jackson in uh, Richmond. So I, I may. I'm sorry. Uh, did was it the uh, protest that tore it down? Yeah, or was it? This I think it's a official? protest. I think okay. it's a protest. I didn't um, see that yet. I think. Well, I think it was in today's. I think it was in today's paper. But it, there have been many of both. We, we've yeah. had some institutions that said we should have fixed this a long time ago. We we're ashamed of it. We're tearing it down. And then others. Uh, in Portland, Oregon, they tore down a statue of, of George Washington. Of excuse me, was it Christopher Columbus or George? I can't remember. There are there, there's so many of them now. Um, I um, I wonder your thoughts on that. In particular, uh, Mount Rushmore is it? it people are talking about Mount Rushmore. That that yeah. I love his name. Good son Borglum is the sculptor of Mount Rushmore. I think it's a magnificent thing, but it's alleged that. He had connections to the KKK. I don't know how strong they were, real they are. It doesn't really matter. But on that uh, mountain, you've got uh, Theodore Roosevelt, who yes. was uh, Teddy Roosevelt, who was an uh, imperialist and an uh, oppressor of, of people of color. You've got uh, George Washington, a slave owner. Yeah. Uh, Abraham Lincoln, who took too long to sign the ambassador. You know, you can you can make a you can make a claim. You should tear them all down. I. And I think Thomas Jefferson is the fourth guy. He's a really bad slave owner. Yeah. Um, so, you know, when this started, I thought, you know, you, you might want to put some guards at the Jefferson Memorial because he's coming. He might be coming down and got the Washington Monument. You got 
the city of Washington. Um, yeah. you know, so, so my thought is that I, I understand that urge uh, to destroy those uh, those things, but they are symbols of more than racism. So what do we do about that? And can we have a can we have a country? where our whole national narrative, come back to our previous question, I think in some people's eyes, and you know, I, I can understand the argument, it's, it's rotten to the core. So you know, it was founded, the country was founded by slave owners. Its founding documents were written by slave owners. It cuts John Adams some slack, but what do we do with that? Do we just say, start over again as a, as a country with a blank slate? Or do we try to come to grips with that in a different way? What do you think? What do you think? Well, okay. Uh, let me distinguish between the political, which is there's a fight going on, and it ain't over. Um, and if you like the kind of ethical, philosophical, okay? So yeah. uh, as a political matter, I worry uh, that people are vastly overplaying their hand. Yeah. I worry about backlash, okay? You and I, we're intellectuals. We're sitting here talking about George Washington, Thomas Jefferson. They were slave owners, should we, whatever, whatever. There are a lot of people who, who are just going to react to this. Is I want my country back. Yeah, they're already. Keep up. your hands off my, you're going to pull down the statue of the a founding father. What are you going to do, blow up Rushmore? Is that it? You yeah. terrorists, what are you? You're the Taliban uh, blowing up these Buddhist uh, statues in uh, Afghanistan. You're... you're, you're and I want my country back and keep your hands off my country. Now, they're going to get called racist uh, in the polite society cocktail parties. And nobody's going to give a damn. And somebody like Donald Trump is going to be president again. And so be careful, okay? You're playing with fire, all right? You're, you're, it, this is not uh, a racist monument set up by the Daughters of the Confederacy in 1910 to remind the uh, coloreds to stay in their place. This is the country. This is the United States of America. Uh, so really, there's nothing here worth celebrating. Really, the is founding of the country is not it, is it it, irredeemable. It's a, exactly, it's 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 a, you know uh, only an expression of white supremacy. There's nothing else that's going on here. Uh, so. I think that it's not over. I think the iconoclasts are having their way for a moment, but I think we had better be careful because this is um, in, in process and uh, there's going to be a lot of consequence of the, of the iconoclasm that's gonna be uh, not, I think, healthy uh, for the Republic. Um, but on the substance of the matter, on the kind of ethics, you know, should you uh, let TR statue or monument uh, alone? Uh, you know, I mean, there are a number of points that, be, that one could make here. One is about the anachronistic projection of contemporary sensibility back onto times that are, you know, long gone. And then the holding of people to a standard of behavior, which if they had actually adhered to it, would have required them to be virtually alone in their heroism in contravening the tenor of their times. Uh, yes, there were abolitionists in the 18th century when Thomas Jefferson was pinning the Declaration of Independence, but there weren't that, weren't that many of them. Yeah. Uh, everybody recognized that the uh, process that led to the founding of the country, that a compromise was going to have to be uh, made with this uh, awful institution. Um, the fact of the matter is they set in place a structure that had the capacity within a century of leading to the extirpation of the institution. A lot of blood on the battlefield is uh, along the way, but Lincoln is clearly in his it, presiding over this uh, transformation, drawing on the intellectual and uh, moral resources that are set out in, in the period of the founding. Um, Slavery is not new to human history when in 1619, when some Africans are offloaded in Virginia. Slavery is ubiquitous in human history on every continent and every culture and every civilization going back to antiquity. The new idea, the modern idea, the enlightened mind idea, the Western idea, the idea about liberty, liberty and the value of the individual, 
um, is uh, reflected in the founding of the United States of America and has borne fruit through our institutions. So, I mean, I, this is not to excuse night riders. <laughs> this, this is not to say that there wasn't rape in the slave Lynch quarters. And, 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 and I mean, come on, this history is littered with all kinds of awful stuff. This is awful. It's awful stuff. The appropriation of the lands of the native people and the extirpation of the native population of the Western Hemisphere. I mean, that was a world historic catastrophe for those people. Yep. I don't dispute that. Nope. But here we are. Now, look around the world. I don't know where people are finding an example of practical government implemented by real people through actual concrete institutions that um, has a greater capacity for self-reform and for expansion of liberty than that which we are enjoying right here in this republic. So I would say keep it under uh, proportion. I mean, don't be so uh, self-absorbed that you think that uh, your particular beef is the only thing that's going on. Um, and uh, that would cause me to be much more conservative about the iconoclasm, iconoclasm. I mean, conservative just in the sense of having a very high threshold before I try to wipe. Now, co context, what do you put in a history book? How do you tell the story? These things are going to be renegotiated over and over again through time. It should be. Should be, but but we're we're a, we're a pluralistic society, you know. And not everybody is on the same page about all of these things, and we have to get along. Well, I'm, you know, I'm. My listeners know I'm Jewish. Uh, I I lived for 14 years in St. Louis. Uh, St. Louis is named after a man that is uh, famous among Jews for his anti-Semitism. Uh, he burned tens of thousands of the uh, manuscripts of the Talmud, one of the most precious sources of Jewish wisdom. I, I suspect he he got Jews involved in disputes over the church, and we always lost uh, <laughs> because um, the judges made the decisions were maybe not so objective. Uh, and I suspect, I don't remember, but I suspect he killed a few Jews along the way or created some pogroms that, that did that. So there's some Jews in St. Louis asking, you know, let, we should take down the statue of, of Mr. Lewis of King Lewis in uh, in Forest Park, uh, and maybe change the name of the city. And I, um, 23% of St. Louis is Catholic. They think he's a saint. Not just like, yeah, he wasn't so bad. They think God thinks he's a saint. Now, I don't agree. But as you say, we're a pluralistic society. I, I'm okay with, with calling it St. Louis. And, and I think about the arch, actually. I don't think about the the anti-Semite. But I, I think um, it's very hard in, in a moment of, and to give the other side stew for a minute, I think in a, w when rage and, and a feeling of injustice is built up over time, I understand the urge to, to destroy. It's not a, it's a very human urge. And I think the, the challenge is, is, as you point out, and as we've talked about, alluded to earlier, uh, that doesn't end well. Um, I think, um, well, let me just say a different thing, and then I'll let you react to it. It's a, it's July 2nd. We're almost at July 4th. Uh, tomorrow is July 3rd, and tomorrow Disney will be streaming uh, a film version of Hamilton. Uh, Hamilton was kind of uh, uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda's work of, of genius, in my view. Um, yeah, I've where seen he basically, the show. He, he basically said... He, you know, Hamilton is not the star of that show. Alexander Hamilton is not the star. The star of that show is the United States of America and the vision that the founders had in 1776 that they could not live up to. And what Hamilton is about as a show to me is holding their feet to the fire and saying, when we tell this story with black and Latino and Latino actors and actresses, we have a reminder of what that richer story is all about. It's not the history book version that, that, that you know, my parents learned in Memphis, Tennessee in 1950 or 1947. And it's not the revisionist version, which says the whole thing is rotten to the core. It's complicated. And I think I love the idea because that's kind of my motto of this program, that, that we could go forward as Americans recognizing it's complicated. But my worry is, is that we're not going to have a country soon. We're not going to have a nation. We're going to have a civil war. It's not going to be a racial civil war. It's going to be a different kind. Well, I hope you're wrong about that. I agree Me with too. you about Hamilton. 
I thought you said it very well. It is complicated. And uh, there is there is a very powerful effect of those actors of color, the spectacular music and the uh, drama uh, enacting this uh, uh, moment in world history and in American history at the founding. It's it's uh, it's quite powerful. And it's it's my story, too, even though some of my ancestors were owned by some of the characters who were being portrayed. And that's so there's only some of my ancestors because some of my ancestors are Europeans, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's close to talk about an institution that you and I are both uh, deeply involved in, which is the university. Uh, when you and I went to graduate school, I'm a little younger than you, but not much. When we went to graduate school, there was still an idea that a university was a place that people would go to learn about things and think about great ideas and write about them and think and interact with great minds. It's gotten a little more complicated since then. Uh, it tries to serve that institution. I think it's serving other purposes, but in particular right now, it's uh, been very, um, I don't know what the right word is, electrified by the, a, a current is surging through it related to, I don't know, identity politics, um, all kinds of, of interesting, complicated social forces. And your university came out with a statement about the current race situation. You were brave enough and bold enough to challenge it. Uh, you can talk about that if you want, or you can just talk about what you think the university is, is, has become and where it might be headed. Well, I'll tip my hand by telling you that I, was, I went back and picked up Alan Bloom's book, The Closing of the American Mind. And I couldn't put I couldn't put it down uh, because I felt that I mean people can look this up. I felt that this is mid 1980s when he's writing, yeah, uh, and that he had, he put his finger on some of the stuff that that I think is problematic. Um, and it's going to sound old fashioned, right? I mean, uh, when I was in college, it was the 19 early 1970s. I graduated from Northwestern University in 1972. Uh, there weren't any Afro American studies departments. Um, th there wasn't any, you don't have any requirements here. Yeah, you had to learn a foreign language. I took German, you know, re reading Goethe, and Rilke, and Kafka, and Mann. You know, I mean, uh, <laughs> I had to take a, 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 a distribution of courses across the sciences, social sciences. I majored in mathematics. I minored in economics. I took a lot of philosophy. Um, I, got, I got a very good education at Northwestern University in the early 1970s and went on to MIT um, and uh, very rigorous quantitative training in economics. So that's me. But stuff is a lot footloose and fancy free now. Uh, you can find an education in the university. You can find one at Brown. You can find one at Berkeley or Stanford. But you can also spend four years there and not learn a goddamn thing worth knowing and come yeah. out with a degree. Great inflation. <laughs> Great inflation is a horrible corruption, in my opinion. And I know I spit in the wind in oh, saying yeah. so because there's no God bless you, Glenn. <laughs> there's no there's no turning back, man. There's no turning back. But it's, you know, uh, I now have to basically uh, anticipate the possibility that kids going to go home and, you know, take a bottle of pills or something if I give them a C. Yeah. You know, you've ruined my life. I'll never get into law school. I'll never get into medical school. You can't be a police professor. Lawyer. You can't do this to me. You can't do this. You know, yeah. whatever. And I'm saying, man, <laughs> look at that paper that you wrote. You didn't, you know, <laughs> you didn't write a very good paper. I'm sorry. <laughs> but I end up with the B anyway half the time, you know, because I just can't do it. And, um, yeah. Um, I think therapeutic. That's, you a, know, that's a wealth phenomenon, by the way. Right. That, that's the, um, In, the blessing of and curse of, of our of our standard of living. Yeah, I, I guess you're right about that. Uh, so I interrupted you. Therapeutic, you were going to say. I agree with you about identity politics. I mean, I, I, I have a little speech I give at the beginning of some of my classes. I say I don't believe in identity pedagogy. Uh, I don't believe in identity epistemology. And I don't believe in identity politics. So I have my. And what do I mean by that? Uh, identity pedagogy is, well, we're going to teach different because you're black. Identity epistemology is, well, there's some facts that people don't know because they are this particular thing or they inside knowledge. I'm a black person. I understand this better in virtue of being black. 
and identity politics, meaning that I think of myself primarily as uh, as a, a person that belongs to one of these groups. I define myself in terms of gender, race, uh, sexual orientation, and so forth like that. When in fact, we are so much more than that. There's so many uh, valences and dimensions to our expression of our humanity. And when I'm talking to 18 to 22 year olds, I want to say to them, like, God, you're at this uh, moment, this precious moment when the world is your oyster. Everything is open to you. you, you don't uh, tunnel down into a silo. Don't don't bury yourself in a in a closed off identity defined uh, sense of what's possible. Open your mind. Open, you know. So uh, there's that. So I, uh, in a way, I'm just defending why I thought Alan Bloom's uh, 35 year old uh, reflections were still worth were, were still worth reading. As far as the politicization, and this is the thing. Police Commissioner of New York City in 2013 wants to come and give a lecture and he's invited here to Brown and basically the students and townsmen and women decide that he can't talk, they shout him down. And then basically the progressive faculty kind of back it, even though Brown has rules about you're not supposed to interrupt people while they're speaking, they don't enforce those rules. And then a report is written saying that racial profiling is a bad thing. Uh, which it may or may not be, but I found that to be completely irrelevant to the question of whether or not the police commissioner from New York City should be permitted to speak. If it's a bad thing, let him speak, and then we can point out why it's bad, and so on. The politicization um, has many manifestations of that, but the most recent one was this uh, in the wake of Floyd, George Floyd's death. The uh, president at my university felt that she had to send a letter around uh, to the entire university community expressing her opposition to anti-Black racism. Uh, and I thought, okay, oh, the president is opposed to anti-black racism. So am I. That's great. But then I noticed that the letter was signed by every top administrator at the university. Uh, and then when I read the letter, I found that it, it, it trafficked in the tropes and language and uh, rhetoric of, uh, of the Black Lives Matter type of social justice advocacy. And I thought my president is entitled to her opinion, but surely the university ought not to have a position about something like this. Um, and I objected to the sense of groupthink and the kind of imposition of a party line, which basically it's saying we are Brown, Brown's values are the following. And I wondered, how could I teach my students in an undergraduate course on race and inequality to consider critically the question, do we know that Derek Chauvin was motivated by race when he kept his knee on George Floyd's neck? Okay, that question is a question. How do we know? What would be the evidence? What would justify our conclusion that that was a racial event? What would support our inclination to link it with other events of a similar kind, Eric Garner in Staten Stat uh, Stat Island, or Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, or Freddie Gray in Baltimore, Maryland, and then construct a narrative? What's that based on? Is that us imagining something, or is it something that's real? How would we know? Now, these are first order questions. I didn't answer them, I just asked them. But my president of the university, by sending around a letter signed by every top administrator insisting that a particular interpretation of these events was the one that Brown's values required, precludes me from the possibility of engaging my students critically on such a question. That is not what a university should be. So uh, what is she doing? Well, a generous interpretation is that she is absolutely convinced of what she has said, and so are every single one of the 20 most influential administrators in the university so convinced. That would be the most generous. A less charitable interpretation is that they are anticipating a hysterical reaction from students on campus that would be disruptive in demonstration and protest. And they're trying to get out in front of it by signaling to our charges that uh, we're woke uh, and uh, responsive to their sensibility and that we are in standing, quote, in solidarity with. A university standing in solidarity with? We're standing in solidarity. A university which is supposed to be the site where people think critically and deeply about matters in light of all that human uh, culture has produced heretofore, is gonna stand in solidarity with something, anything, anything. Stand in solidarity with the New Deal. Stand in solidarity with uh, a war effort. Uh, no, that's not what a university should be doing. So um, I felt that it was imperative to object to that. 
Yeah, we'll put a link up to that article you wrote. It's quite quite eloquent, although I think you bested it. You did better even here than you did there. Nice, Nicely said. Uh, Thanks, Wes. I think this question of the purpose of university, what's, what is um, deeply troubling to me is this shutting down of certain ideas and the shutting down of debate, conversation, discussion has consequences we don't fully appreciate or understand. I, I'm not, I don't know what they are, those consequences, but when certain things are off the table because they have consequences for your social standing or uh, your cultural well-being, that's the death of a lot of things. It's not just that universities, I think, are less effective now in educating people. I think the public square has less conversation in it now. People are afraid that they, I, I hate to use the, I don't hate to use it. I, I use it with some trepidation. There, there's a, a Maoist um, force let loose in the land. It, it's Stalinist also, this idea of calling out your neighbor calling out your your family members yeah. report reporting on them for for not not for behavior but for inappropriate beliefs and thoughts and that I, I just right. I think that's a very corrupting part of the human you can experience. you can lose your job for retweeting something yeah it just doesn't make sense to me but we're the minority uh Glenn it's um it's the way it is white silence equals violence yeah that I, kind of thing yeah not, I don't think that's so helpful, but that's where we're, that's where we're, um, where, where we're headed. Give me some optimism. Uh, we talked about, it's been a pretty somewhat pessimistic conversation so far. Um, and you're a contrarian, uh, which I, I salute. The things you're saying, I think, um, probably aren't always easy to say. And, and I know you've thought about them a lot, and I, I salute you for that. Um, but give me some optimism where we might be heading. You know, as, I mean, a nation, I, as a nation. Well, um, <laughs> and my, my only optimism is that we recognize something that I think a lot of people have, have failed to recognize, which is what it's like to be black in America. In response to that, I, I worry we might do something um, not so wise. What are your but, thoughts? But, but I mean, is it really what it's like to be black in America? I mean, does Ta-Nehisi Coates or Nicole Hannah-Jones or... Uh, you know, these writers, uh, the, uh, Ava DuVernay, the filmmaker, um, do they, do they, are they telling us what it's like to actually be black in America or are they a reflection of a particular sliver of American and African American culture of uh, relatively prosperous people who are, uh, you know, ideologically left and um, in the throes of a particular narrative about American history that you know, we've already uh, we've already discussed. I don't know if the work a day uh, average person uh, in a African American enclave in an American city necessarily sees the world in the same way. I don't know. These are questions that we could ask. What people have to say about the Fourth of July, about the founding of the country, and so on. We could ask. I wouldn't necessarily take what I see from the talking heads uh, and in the, on the op-ed pages as dispositive um, in that regard. Well, uh, so. Here's my optimism, and okay. it's not an optimism about race. I'm actually very pessimistic. Um, I, I think we're cruising for a bruising. I think things are going to get worse before they get better. I think when you have mobs, in effect, uh, outside of courthouses, uh, demanding, quote unquote, justice, which means the conviction of people, in effect, independently of what the evidence might show, um, that, that that's a very bad thing. I, I think when you get the routine characterization of difficult interactions between citizens and the police in terms of the race of the people who happen to be involved in these things, that's the first thing they say. I worry, I worry that tomorrow I'm gonna wake up to a world in which black criminality is legitimately a term of discussion in public discourse because the racialization of the interaction between police and uh, and citizens has uh, become so uh, so routine, um, and uh, that's that's uh, that's a world of trouble. So I, I'm not, but but I look at the last fifty years. So you go back to 1970 and how the country has changed. And one of the things that has changed dramatically is we have had an enormous wave of immigration, largely from non-European sources. 
yeah. uh, from Asia, from Latin America, and um, uh, to a lesser extent from Africa uh, and Europe. But we've had a huge, massive flow of people. And what has been the net result of that? The net result of that has been one of the most remarkable stories in modern history of the incorporation. Again, again, because we also had a huge wave of immigration from non uh, from uh, European uh, uh, sources earlier in the 20th, the late 19th, earlier in the 20th yeah. century. The dynamism, the, the, the uh, capacity of our society to absorb, to the, the countless number of stories of families whose lives have been transformed and enhanced, the possibility. Uh, this is a very, very, very good thing. I mean, remember, uh, the United States of America defeated fascism in the 20th century, or at least contributed very, very profoundly to the defeat yeah. of fascism in the 20th century. The statues that you want to tear down, uh, the, the uh, systemically racist white supremacist country that you want to teach our children to hate uh, is the country that saved the world from the Soviet, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. I mean, the Cold War, the, yeah. So there, there's, there's, uh, I, you know, I'm I'm rambling a little bit here, and I apologize. I am optimistic about the country overall. I think that of the United States, with all of its flaws, is nevertheless a force for good in human history. Um, I am not so optimistic about working out the race relations problems, at least not in the short run, uh, because of the ideological sway that a certain kind of uh, 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 racially progressive um, uh, rhetoric and, and political philosophy is, is, is exerting on, um, on so many Americans. My guest today has been Glenn Lowry. Glenn, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you, Russ. My pleasure. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.